me as a toy maker and your gel and like I think we need to stop and think like what we are doing is somehow helping to that situation or is making it worse the same way we do with mesh toys so why are we so focused on creating eco-friendly toys to help with the environment or mesh toys to help with mental health or stem toys to empower girls and like kids to be better in math or like why are we doing all of those things and we're not questioning ourselves why are we still playing with guns You are listening to Making It in the Toy Industry, episode number 175. Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors and entrepreneurs like you. And now your host, Ajel Wade. Hey there, toy people. Ajel Wade here, and welcome back to another episode of the Toy Coach Podcast, Making It in the Toy Industry. This is a weekly podcast brought to you by thetoycoach.com. Today's episode is a really sensitive topic. So I'm telling you, if you normally listen to this podcast with kiddos in the background or an earshot, I might recommend turning this one off for them and watching it later when you've got some time alone. Now, I'd been unsure if we should really address this topic on the show, but after I met with my friend Marjorie Spittlenick in our little podcast planning session, I knew we had to. So based on a report by ABC News, as of May 1st, 2023, more than 13,900 people have been killed in gun violence in the U.S. That is a rough average of 115 deaths every day. Of those who died, 491 were teens and 85 were children. As of May 1st, there had also been 184 mass shootings in the U.S., and a mass shooting is defined as any situation where four or more people are shot, and there have been 13 K-12 school shootings so far this year. Now, since we all work in the toy industry, and it's our kids and our teens that are under attack, I think it's important that we have this conversation about what we can do if there's anything. Now, joining me on this podcast today is Marjorie Spittlenick, the founder of Little Rebels, the plush doll line, currently available at Macy's, Frost Museum, Michigan Museum, Discovery World, Air Museum, Museum in Flight, and over 15 specialty toy stores across the U.S., Now, Marjorie has been a guest on this podcast before. If you want to hear her older episodes, head over to thetoycoach.com forward slash 15 or thetoycoach.com forward slash 151. Now, MJ always seems to show up when it's time to have tough conversations, and she's the one that is allowing me to have those conversations. And I say allowing because it's not easy to put yourself out there and talk about hard topics and doing it with a friend makes it all the more better. So Marjorie, welcome to the show and thank you for being willing to have this talk with me today. Thank you for having me. I love being in this show. So every time you actually invite me in for me, it's kind of like, yay, I'm (laughs) going to be at a show podcast again. It's kind of like a little win. And uh, yeah, it is a hard topic. I agree with you, but also I think it's our responsibility as toy makers to address this because it's affecting as you said at first is affecting our kids so what can we do as toy makers if there's something we can do actually to just open the conversation i know this may there might be people that are gonna get really mad at us i'm aware of that Uh, i'm up to it like i honestly i think this is a tough topic but it needs to be talked about. So yeah, if they get mad, I'm so sorry in advance, but yeah, we need to do it. We are sorry. I don't want anyone listening to the podcast to feel that we are attacking their freedom. That's not what this is up. And I want to like, let that crystal clear from the beginning of the episode. So nobody get offended to it. We're just trying to open up the conversation to ask toy makers, is there anything that we can do to help reduce the death, especially between kids and teens. Like all that, of course, but like teens and kids are our audience. So that I think it affects us directly. And the other thing that I'm going to say before going in is like, I get the fun 
on the guns. I used to play with my daughter, like battles, then paintball, then laser tags. We used to be like one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. So it's kind of hard for me to to actually talk about this and not feel some irony in what I'm talking. But like when I try to sit down and really think like what's the real impact that toys have in kids, then that's when the conversation starts because there's a lot of studies out there that shows that the way kids play when they're kids and, and what they choose to play with have a huge impact on their careers, for example, when they grow up. Let's say dolls. Why do I have Little Rebels? Why did I create Little Rebels? Because I'm trying to empower girls to become engineers, mathematicians, scientists, whatever they want to be, no matter the gender. And it's like scientific fact that the way they play and the toys that they used to play as kids have a positive impact when they grow up. So with that in mind, if they have a positive impact, they can also have a negative impact. It's kind of, it, it kind of goes both ways, right? It's, it's not just, oh yeah, it works positive because it's convenient for me. And then we leave the negative out of it because it's not good for the business. Like this is the ugly truth of this, but it's how it is. And I do get that some guns are really fun, like bubble guns or water guns, or like they are not created to harm anyone, but kids at very young age might lose the perception of what's right or wrong. Let's back up a little bit. I want to, I want to first talk about like the impact of general toys on kids So for your product specifically, I'd love an example since I have you here of maybe reviews you've gotten from parents or messages you've gotten from kids after they played with your product saying, oh my gosh, your product taught my daughter about Amelia Earhart. She'd never heard of her before. Now she wants to be a pilot. Has that ever happened? Yeah, yeah, that actually, I have a bunch of stories. And (laughs) that's one of my favorite, no, that's one of my favorite parts of this business. We do get like a bunch of stories of parents that reach out to me. And then, for example, you mentioned Amelia. There was one mom that sent me a picture of her daughter sitting inside of a carton box that she created as an airplane playing with her Amelia, saying that she was going to be a pilot when she grew up. And then another mom that did the same thing with a kid, um, a little girl as well, that she put chairs together and she literally built a plane in the living room, like with the chairs. And she was sitting. That, That was amazing. I need to find that and post it. So she had like the entire role of the plane passengers. And she was uh, oh, the pilot. So pilot. Cute. <laughs> and then in the same way that we were empowering girls and like sharing those stories, boys also, like I have a lot of moms that come to me and say, hey, thanks to your dolls, my boys are now treating their sisters differently. Oh, interesting. And I have Two cases. One, it's like he's very small. He, I think he's around three or four now. I don't remember. But it's like whenever it was diaper changing time, he will get his Amelia and he will literally put like the cream. And I, she, like, it was funny because she wrote me and she was like, the quality of your plushes is insane. And I was like, oh, thank you. And she was like, no, no, no. You have no idea how many times did I had to wash it already because ah. my little boy... Every time I go and do the diaper change on the baby, he brings Amelia and he changes her diaper as well. Oh, wow. So but the boys are using her for nurturing. So it's clearly impacting in many, many ways. And then um, there were two siblings that I met in Brazil and I gave them one Malala and one Mary Curie. Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, the dad wrote to me to thank me. And he said, like, if it was not by your dolls, my kids will never hear about these women. And now all they talk about, like they go to school and they share with their friends how brave Malala was, because even though she was shot, ironically, she stood up. And so they they learn about courage and resilience and speaking up. 
So nowadays when they don't agree with something or they see somebody like being bullied, they will speak up and that's a direct consequence of your doll. Like that was like, wow. Like I know that my dolls have an impact. That's why I'm doing them. Right. So like I'm trying to empower these kids, but actually hearing that and like getting the feedback from directly from the parents telling you like, this is the impact is now it's not on the future only it's like literally happening we can see it happening on a daily basis so yes toys do have an impact for sure yeah and we often see these posts we were talking on linkedin where people are talking about the importance of stem toys and mesh toys stem toys to help kids build their knowledge of like math and science and then mesh toys to help kids deal with their social emotional health. And everyone wants to say like toys can have such a positive impact on kids, which is great. And nobody's talking about how toys could also have a negative impact on kids. So I want to go to something that you said where you brought up a really interesting thought. And that was we are introducing toy guns in the form of bubble guns, in the form of Nerf guns to kids at such a young age. And then after they're introduced to this gun that they're allowed to shoot their friends with and their friends are okay and they're pretending to get hurt, they go through life and life is difficult and challenging. And we don't know what challenges they'll have. We don't know what emotional distress they'll go through. And they go through that after being given this toy gun? And how do we know where that lands in their psyche if they have a difficult life, if they have a difficult upbringing? And I thought that was a really interesting observation. Can you talk more to that? Yes, I was actually, I had this conversation yesterday also. And it's like, the fact that they're playing with gun makes them automatically mass shooters? No, definitely not. That's not what I'm saying. But if a kid goes through a lot of bullying or they're like being mistreated or they feel an injustice or like life has been really, really hard on them and they have a very easy access to guns and they are used to use guns because they're playing with their video games so they know how it works or they're playing with their toys so they know that if they get a gun, like they can go on and shoot everybody with no consequences because it's a game. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I think that at some point in their psyche, as you're saying, they lose the sense of what's right and wrong. Or even like what's real. Some of them, exactly. Some yeah. of them might be so affected by what happened to them that they really don't Like, I don't know, I'm trying to think about those mass shooters in schools, particularly. Most of them were bullied kids. They were really angry. And they entered to, like, revenge their bullies and end up killing innocent people that had nothing to do with it. But why is that? Because their perception, their reality, like, they lose sense of reality and perception. I'm not saying, again, the fault is the toys. I'm just saying that the toy at some point, makes shooting fun when it should not be fun. Like, it should be fun to kill your friend. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I heard, like, one of my best friends, she's a doctor, and a few stories that she brought to me throughout the years was, you have no idea how many kids die or get hurt by accident because parents have guns in their houses and they're playing or they think they're playing. So when they should thinking nothing's going to happen and they're just going to pretend to be like, Oh yeah, I'm dead and blah. And then they will come back to life. Yeah. Then tragedy happens. It's not like there's their intention. They cannot distinguish what is play from what is reality. So yeah, I do think that there's a responsibility in us as toy makers to like ask that question, like, are are we making shooting somebody fun? Shouldn't be. If that's what we're doing, we're doing wrong. That's like the main focus. Like, are we 
making guns too fun. You said that when we first had our conversation. Why are we making guns look yeah. like so much fun? They're so colorful. It's it's interesting because toy guns are colorful so that you know they're not real guns, right? But when we yeah. look at that little kid that had a toy gun and then actually got shot, it's like obviously that doesn't make enough of a difference. And then yeah. the gun is still a gun and it's still giving that idea that it's fun. And if we if we believe that a doctor set toy for a kid can inspire them to be a doctor, why is it so hard to draw this line of a gun toy can inspire a kid to go shoot things they shouldn't be shooting? Like, why is it so hard to draw that? So say somebody wants is is clear and this message is getting to them and they're like, oof, you're right. I've never thought about it that way. Maybe our guns are influencing kids at too young of an age. Maybe we need to talk about, should there be an age limit? There are certain products out in the world that you're not allowed to buy at a certain age. Should there be an age Maybe. limit to play guns? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Right. Honestly, I, like I don't have the solution. And we're right. not here to bring a solution or to say like, this is right and this is wrong. We're just... Starting conversation. Like debating something that really bother us and we're trying to look for solutions but between all of us maybe setting a minimum age is a way to go maybe instead of like i don't know having it gun shaped we can change the shape i don't know there's a bunch of toy designers super creative out there can we make bubbles that don't come out from a gun right why does it have to be a bubble gun why does it have to be shaped as a gun? Maybe it doesn't have to. Like, maybe it doesn't have to be shaped as a gun. It right. could be, I don't know, like, I, I'm I'm really like bad a at wrist, this. a wristband. It, it could be a wristband like, with, like, discs that fly right, exactly. out. Exactly. Right. Or, like, a ring that you do like this and yeah. all the bubbles come out. I, like, I don't know. That actually but sounds very the cool. Fact <laughs> that sounds cool. But the fact that our first thought is to make it a gun is maybe the problem. And maybe we're not taking enough responsibility as an industry for the fact that we're introducing these to kids at such a young age and making it too comfortable and making it too, just making it too comfortable. It's fine. If they want to grow up and they want to learn, go to a shooting range and they want to learn how to shoot, that's their prerogative. But when they're young, are we as an industry? That's a lot. Right. It's, out, it's on us. There's something to be said about people who are your elders guiding you so that you can hold off on experiencing things that might be too much for your mind to handle early on so that you could experience them later and decide when your like brain is fully formed, whether or not this is something yes. you want to engage in and bring into your life and a responsibility you want to take on. I do know that they have a legal minimum age to buy gun that I knew what, yeah. what I'm, thinking is should just like as you asked first should we make a minimum age to toy guns as well like and right. we were talking on our prior to this podcast like there are stores and actually toy companies that do not work with toy guns there's a right. reason why they don't right right and so i mean why they don't why don't they like what what's stopping them from selling because they're losing a lot of like a big portion of the market refraining to selling toy guns but there's a reason why they are not and that's because it's aligned with their mission or their concept of what a toy can do or should do and i remember like the reason why we started this podcast actually was a post on linkedin that was right. thank you the toy industry for the fidgeting toys creations to help the victims of mass shooting cope with the trauma that they had. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yes, I love that we have that as a tool to help them cope, but we shouldn't have them at, at all at the beginning. Like it sh this shouldn't be a problem. Like kids should not be shot at their schools. Like they should be safe at schools or going into a movie or going into a concert or like having fun with friends. Yeah. It's insane that you can like, I don't know. So yeah, I'm grateful that we have toys that help them cope, but maybe we should rethink the way that we are 
providing toy guns, toys to, to our kids and the access, maybe limiting the age access, maybe looking for the same mechanic. Yeah, um, different shape but, products so that you're not... Say, I mean, I get the fun behind it. As I was saying in the at the beginning of this episode, like I'm, I really have a lot of fun. So like, this is a hard topic for me to talk about it, but I'm 40. Right. Like, and the truth is, I did not start playing with this kind of things until I was like, a teenager, maybe. I don't remember having gun toys around me when I was growing up as a little girl. I do remember that then when, yeah, I was maybe 15, 16, zero, 16, um, my friends had like the water guns and we started on summer playing with water guns and doing water battles and stuff like that. And then came paintball and laser tags. But I was like older. I was not five. I was not four. I was not six. Like I was more or less already shaped. I'm not like I'm still shaping my mind, but like yeah. at least I can distinguish between reality and fantasy. And uh, what's like I think that's the main issue. Like at what age? Maybe we should get in touch with a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, Ooh, a professional. That yes. Tell us, like, so hear me out. This is the age where the psyches of the kid can distinguish between reality and fantasy. And that's the minimum age to play with a toy gun. That is a very good they, idea. They yeah. will understand what's reality and what not. Because like kids at a very young age, they have right. imaginary friends. Yeah. And they're 100% convinced that their friends are real. Right. And they will set up a plate for them at the table and they will talk to them and they will interact with them. And for them, that imaginary situation is real. And so is shooting a friend. Right. And if on top of it, it's fun. It's like, it's just like, that's just not, why would, why would we, why would we feed into that? When it's so easy, yeah. I mean, so easy. I know there, there's probably millions of dollars. I, I wish we could define the figures, like how much money is spent on toy guns. But maybe there's a new way to approach that and just change the design of it, like we're saying. It's not going to be easy, but change never is. It doesn't mean that we don't need to do it. I mean, this is an uncomfortable conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. But somebody thought it. And we, like... We need to start talking about this and we need to start yeah. seeing the impact. And again, we cannot be so hy hypocrites, hypocrites, how do you say Hi hypocritical? In <laughs> hypocritical, thank you, I'm sorry. To to come out with a very strong speech about how mesh toys helping mental health and STEM choice, helping developing skills and like all the positive attitudes and like Dolls neglecting help with nurture, the nurturing and yeah. Like and Legos help with on. building and, but, but we look exactly. at toy guns like and we're, we're like, we're literally developing like distress and finesse and like your skills. Like why you go to a kindergarten, like Montessori, for example, methodology is all through play. Why? There's a reason why it's all through play. It's because you learn better through play. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's kind of scary well, when you think it, about it. It's scary. It's scary it, it, to it, think because like water guns are different. There are other guns that like hurt when you hurt somebody. Water guns at very least, you're not hurting somebody, but there are some toy guns I've played with that like when you hit the other person, it hurts them a little bit. And it's just this like subtle psychological shift that you have to do to like have fun while hurting your friend. And it's like a little yeah, hurt. Exactly. It's little. That's it's a little right. thing. But it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're having fun hurting other people. Like that's uh, the entire goal of the yeah, game. Yeah. It's so. so like nobody stop to think about this. But when you really yeah. stop to think about this, like in code, mm -hmm. leave all your... I don't know, beliefs behind for a second and just right. like go through the most raw thought that you can have about the dynamics of Valorant, for example. Wait, I just yeah. remember something that most people must have forgotten, but if you're born in the 80s like I was, what? We used to have chocolate cigarettes. Oh, yes. I remember. Yes. 
Oh, and wow. it was the best thing ever. And it, you were super cool. And we used to play that we were smoking our chocolates. Oh, my gosh. And heads up, like, I was a smoker a lot. Like, I smoked during a lot of years of my life. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm not saying blame on the chocolates. But, like, I, I spent my entire childhood playing to be a smoker and I grew up to be a smoker we used to play that it was cool to be out there smoking and actually I think that we used to have toys that were cigarettes as well wow and like what happened to that obviously at some point someone said this is not okay because we're this is wrong exactly (laughs) we cannot keep doing this at some point and I don't know when they disappeared but I remember that they disappeared from the market eventually. I found this article about about those candy cigarettes, and it says, quote, this is a truetreatscandy.com, said, quote, while many anti-candy activists cited the artificial or otherwise unsavory ingredients in candy, their objection to candy cigarettes was different. They wouldn't kill you exactly, but they would ruin your life. One of them, Reverend James E. Smith, declared in 1902 that these candies may look harmless, but they are leading the minds of our boys toward temptation, and they are enticing our children to become drunks and cigarette fiends. The Reverend was far alone from alone in his. The Reverend was far from alone in his crusade. There were uh, there other people who were in 1906 fighting against this. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I I remember like I used to work in advertising for a long time and whenever they like there was a, a moment in advertising that you needed to be very careful with uh, drinking products like mm-hmm. whenever a, a, like a brand of liquor came in and cigarettes cuz like Marlboro when they had like that cowboy coming in right and smoking it He made it look cool. And um, so that entire generation, which is my generation, we grew up thinking smoking was the coolest thing ever. And all kids wanted to smoke. And then there was 90210, the TV show where uh, Dylan used to smoke and Dylan was the hearty one. And so everybody wanted to be like Dylan. And then like, I don't know, Grease. There's so many examples on how young minds are influenced by what they see. And why yeah. they have access to. Apparently, candy cigarettes were indeed banned in the U.S. in 2009 under the FDA's Family Smoking Prevention and Control Act. The debate behind the FDA's the debate behind the FDA's decision was based on studies showing that candy cigarettes led to cigarette smoking. Interesting. I'm not saying it's 100% the chocolate cigarette's fault, but I grew up playing that I was a smoker and I later became a smoker. So yeah, that has to be some influence in in somebody's psyche eventually. So I'm looking on Wikipedia now. So so I think the US ban was peeled back a little bit, but it's candy cigarettes banned in Australia, Belgium, Brazil... Chile, Finland, Ireland, Kuwait, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Portugal, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, Thailand, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom. Then the there are some caveats because Canada has federal law prohibits candy cigarette branding that resembles real cigarette branding. And then the United States says the candy can't be labeled as cigarettes. So interesting. Huh. Yeah. So I like, I don't know. I just feel it's a weird, tough conversation to have. Yeah. And, uh, but like, it's not that we're saying stop manufacturing toy guns. It's just let's rethink the impact that we are having right. by creating those tools. Let's yes. stop and rethink if should we address it to a specific age range? Yeah, yeah. Should we 
shape them differently? Should we change the dynamics? Should we just put a warning sign that says like not advice for childs under yes. a certain age, like this may be a trigger. I don't know, trigger warnings before the commercial. I don't, I honestly, I don't have the answer, but I do right. know we that think at about some it. point, and again, I'm, we're not saying, and for me, it's super important that this is crystal clear. We're not questioning the rights to have guns. Hmm. We're not questioning the right to have toy guns to produce. Like we're not going against our peers in the industry that are manufacturing or selling them. Like this is important for you to understand and to, to like make sure that this is super clear. I'm, I'm a mom. I live in South America. I consider a gazillion times to move to the U.S. And honestly, one of the things that always kept me from moving, mm-hmm. it's the guns. Because like I'm scared to send my daughter into school and she would never come back. And people tell me, oh, you get used to it. Like they do, um, what is this called? Like drills. And I was like, what? I don't want my daughter like going into a mass shooting drill in school. Like that, that cannot be normal. Like that, that, that horrifies me. Yeah. And then maybe you're going to say, oh, MJ, you're too naive. Well, where I live, we do not have drills for mass shootings in schools. Yeah. I'm not saying like a tragedy cannot happen. Like a couple of friends of my daughter were mugged the other day on the street. Of course, those things will happen. Like I'm not that naive. What I'm yeah. saying is like what we do as toy makers can have a positive impact on reducing those mass shootings somehow. That's my question. It's like, Mm -hmm. I think we need to sit down, stop and think like what, what I'm doing as a toy maker, is it making it better or worse? Am I improving the situation or am I helping escalating it? And I'm only bringing this to attention because how many mass shootings you said there were like, we're May and it's over a hundred mass shootings already. Yep. May, that's insane. We are not questioning what you are doing with your business. We are not attacking anyone. We are not trying to, we're not criticizing our peers' businesses. We're not messing with the people that are making guns. Like, again, I'm one that have a lot of fun playing with bubble guns and all those kind of things. So it's it's not that. Don't get me wrong. It's just that this problem, it's increasing. And me as a toy maker and your gel, and like, I think we need to stop and think like what we are doing is somehow helping to that situation or is making it worse the same way we do with mesh toys. So why are we so focused on creating eco-friendly toys to help with the environment or mesh toys to help with mental health or STEM toys to empower girls and like kids to be better in math or like why are we doing all of those things and we're not questioning ourselves why are we still playing with guns do you have any suggestions for somebody's first step for what they could do if they want to reevaluate how their company might be influencing kids minds with gunplay i i have an idea i would <laughs> that's a that that's actually a good idea yeah uh, <laughs> I mean, I, from a designer well, perspective, I would say look at your assortment and, and count how many, how many gun-shaped or looking products you have, figure out the revenue of those products so that you understand the financial risk to making any adjustments to them. And then I would do a design exercise to redesign those gun toys into a different shape so that you could still have the play but not have the connection to like a gun. That would be the first thing I would think and see how buyers respond to respond to it. If you pitch them this new weird shape, are they going to be like, why is this just not a gun? Or are they going to say, oh, thank goodness we were waiting for somebody to refresh this line so it doesn't have to align with all the horror that's going on in the U.S. right now? You know what? I think I... <laughs> What? This most likely the answer they will get is why are you not bringing me a gun? Because that's <laughs> no, what you don't know. Used- you don't know. No, I don't know. Of course, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, like, I think the exercise needs to be done. Yeah, for sure. 
and I feel it's like a responsibility. Like, I mean, and you might say, yeah, we're going to lose a lot of money, but the same way that big companies like Mattel are investing a ton of money of making Barbies that showcase all the colors of the humanity. And sizes. Yeah. That wasn't like a huge and financial they, win right away. Just, they just launched like a new Down syndrome line Barbie. Yes. And they yeah. have like, so, and that was a huge investment for them. And mm-hmm. that was also a huge change of mentality because they, they like, even though Barbie claim was always, you can be everything, right? Barbie was, you can be everything. Even though that was the claim, like the the iconic Barbie that we all grew up to was the blonde Barbie, perfect shape. Like, even though she was dressed up as a flight attendant, she was still perfect, like physically. And they were all the same. And yep. then Mattel at some point said, wait, no, we're, we do not all look the same. Yeah. We do not all have the same style. We do not have all the same sexual orientation. We do not all share the same genes. And they decided to invest a ton of money to make that shape. There's a reason why they did that. Mm-hmm. And it's because they are looking around the world they're living in and realizing that today's society is not the same as when Barbie was launched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my advice would be maybe sit down just like Mattel and the kudos like to Mattel on doing that and do the exercise to see if like, I'm not saying get rid of all your gun toys, but what if you launch as a test, a toy that does exactly the same thing, but it's not shaped as a gun. Just test it. Yeah. And see what happens. And if that's a hit, then replace it. And remove the gun shape yeah. one. Yeah. I'm not saying go and lose all your inventory and lose all your money, but like, that's make not an, what I'm saying. Make an effort. Out. Make an effort toward the change. Exactly. Go yeah. a little bit above and beyond the regular. Like, do your part if you can. And I know you can. Like, we're constantly having this pitch competitions asking for inventors to come up with ideas. Put that in your list, in your wish list. Yeah. Oh, when yes. you offer inventors to come up with ideas or you go to like Otis Design School and you have, I don't know, like ask them to come up with new ideas on how can you use the same dynamic shape differently. Yes. I'm sure there's going to come a bunch of cool ideas. Like I just threw you the, the, the ring the one. Ring I- Use your wish list for the good when you're looking for new products. Like when you're asking inventors to come up with new ideas, put that in your wish list and say, hey, help us reshape and redefine the gun word. How would you play it? How would you use it? How you do it? I don't know. That's And it has the added benefit mind. of like this is a great initiative that is also marketing gold. Being that company that does that, it's marketing gold and it's good for it's good for the kids that we serve and we create products for. So, yes. Well, MJ, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. If anybody wants to learn more about the resources that we were citing while we were talking, head over to thetoycoach.com forward slash 175. And I'll put the links there. So put the links to contact MJ if you want to talk with her about her line and become one of the many stores carrying it. Or if you just want to talk more about this topic. Do not attack us though. Yeah, do not attack us. We're just... We're just starting conversation. As always, thank you so much for being here with me today. I know there are a ton of podcasts out there, so it truly means the world to me that you tune into this one. Until next week, I'll see you later, toy people. Hey, are you an aspiring toy inventor or toy entrepreneur? then you should check out Toy Creators Academy, the first of its kind online program designed to help you develop and pitch your toy ideas. Head over to toycreatorsacademy.com to learn more.